Hello, my name is Rebecca Tapp. Welcome to season two of the Decoding Purpose podcast, The Turning Point. In this season of the Decoding Purpose podcast, our intention is clear to decode the turning points that catalyze purpose so we can empower conscious choice over crisis and ignite conversations that change the world. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the first edition of The Turning Point, a decoding purpose feature designed to assist you to purposefully navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. The intention for releasing this mini-series of Decoding Purpose is simple, and it's all about our purpose. In the last episode of Decoding Purpose, I said the following words, which I will repeat in a minute, to frame up the reason why Ash from Supernova Sound, the incredible Lizzie Hodgins from Basic Black Creative, and I, as your host, want to show up for you in a way that is helpful and that will assist you in navigating these crazy, crazy times. I often refer to purpose as a guide to the great unknown. It is the cocoon between the caterpillar and the butterfly where the magic of transformation comes to life, where we see what's possible, even in crisis, and we move towards the change required to make that happen. Sometimes we do it by choice, but so often it happens through crisis. The rug is pulled from underneath our feet and we are asked to let go of what we thought defined us. Money, power, status, the old paradigm. Life before COVID-19. Life before our sense of security was taken away. When this wave hits, the vulnerability is raw. After all, when you take away our health or the health of our families, we have nothing. When you take away our high-paying roles, investments or security, we are nothing. When you take away our control and our belief that we are the kings or the queens of the planet, then we are reminded that we are only human. That no matter how rich, how famous or how powerful we are, our entire social paradigm can be taken down by tiny little so-called spike proteins that extend from within the core of the coronavirus to latch onto specific cells in the human body. And that's all it takes to destroy a human empire. Frightening and incredibly humbling all at the same time. But there is something that moves within us that can never be nothing because it is everything. And that is our reason for being. Our legacy. Our purpose. The one thing you have that can help another human being, that can provide healing for another human being, or that can build hope. In coming together, Ash, Lizzie and I asked ourselves, what can we do to help, to heal or to build hope? And in that, we looked at our tools, our time, which we have more of right now, and our talents. The list included a recording studio, a sound engineer, a world-class brand stylist, a podcast host and an incredible network of guests. And that meant we were able to share with you what we know will provide help, healing or give you hope in these times of change. So this is our purpose and our contribution to you is this podcast. So how does it work? In exploring the theme of help, heal and build hope, I will tap into my network of incredible minds who are also on the same mission and who can use this podcast to amplify their voice during this pandemic, however long it takes for us all to get through. Unlike the normal podcast, which will continue to drop every two weeks, I will be dropping the interviews as the information is available. I want you to be able to engage in the content I receive as quickly as we can turn the episodes around. And at the heart of the content is one mission, to help you to purposefully navigate this pandemic and to feel just a little bit more anchored in a time that is undeniably scary for everyone. This is also a platform for you. Please email me at rebecca at rebeccatap.com if you have a guest suggestion or you genuinely have a desire to decode a topic within the context of providing purpose in the pandemic. So without further delay, let's unleash today's guest. Daniel Chia has over 10 years business advisory and commercial accounting experience. 
He commenced his career with four years at Crow Horwath, started his own successful business, then joined Coca-Cola Amatol as the financial accounting manager where he led a successful team of 17 professionals. Today, Daniel is the founding partner of Kelly Partners Northern Beaches. He has a real passion for and specialises in assisting businesses to develop and execute strategies that create business viability. Now, that was obviously Danny's official CV, And so now here's my version. I met Danny five years ago on a charity trip in Cambodia. He is one of the kindest human beings I know who I can say with 110% confidence cares about your money way more than you do. And that's important, particularly in these challenging times. Professionally, Danny has a gift. And his gift is what is enabling him right now in these times of need to shine. This guy has an incredible ability to translate the complexity of financial management. This includes decoding government relief packages, and he provides tips on taking purposeful action and building financial resilience in these crazy times. The best part? Danny makes it so easy to understand what's going on, which is precisely what the world needs at this point in time. Now, as you can imagine, Danny has been inundated with client calls this week, but he still managed to find a spare 40 minutes to decode finance in the turning point for the Decoding Purpose podcast. Danny, I will be forever grateful. Welcome to the podcast, Daniel Chia. Danny Chia from Kelly and Partners, it is such an honour to have you on, on a brand new segment for Decoding Purpose, the turning point, which has a focus on really helping people to purposefully navigate the COVID-19 crisis. I'm so honoured to have you uh, join me here today, Danny. Honoured to be here, Beck. Thank you for having me. So, Danny, I want to kick off uh, with a question that I'll be asking every guest on this segment. What do you believe is the most essential tool for managing a crisis in a purposeful way? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Could <laughs> give me one. a heads up on this question. Yeah, wow. <laughs> You've got this. Um, no, no. So, uh, top of my head without like obviously dwelling on it and thinking about it. Um, I think it's for me, managing crisis in the, you know, the best way and purposefully is more, I guess, staying calm. So, if I'm watching the world, people are either managing the crisis from a place of panic, mm. they're either over the top. Um, analyzing everything and going to the extreme in a world of panic with no kind of mindset of you know, what could happen, or they're putting their head in the sand and saying nothing's going to happen, everything's going to be okay. So for me, it's let's face the brutal facts and and deal with the facts that we've got on hand and calmly make decisions about what we think we should be doing, mm. not just kind of overreacting. Yeah, and look, one of the reasons I wanted to to have you on the podcast today is because I think a big part of your purpose is that you were truly gifted at being able to translate the facts and translate fairly complex uh, information. Now, Danny, I work with with a few incredibly bright people who are not only citing a recession, but in looking at some of these facts, the word depression has been uh, mentioned, which is fairly confronting. Now, it it doesn't matter how Mm. optimistic we are, there is a reality that we need to face here. So in your opinion, what are we looking at over the next six to 12 months? Yeah, it's really difficult. So the more the, the the every hour or every day that this passes, I feel like I'm it's getting worse and worse in terms of the impact it's going to have on the economy. Like I'm just mm. talking to clients constantly and watching them that they're going to be, um, you know, they're shutting down their businesses even if the government's not forcing it yet. They they're getting sending home their staff. They're just walking out of leases. Like people are acting in a way that you've never seen them act before. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. I think from my view, I think the government's going to do a really good job of propping up the economy over the next six months by dumping so much cash into it, um, which is what we're seeing at the moment when we'll talk, we'll touch on these in a second. But I think they're doing everything they can to keep keep money coming into people's hands so no one starves. I think the flow on effect of that though is going to have a huge impact in 12, 18, 24 months where people have to repay these loans or the tax taxes are going to go up or um, you know, we've got all these big ATO debts that we've just kicked down the road because the government said we don't have to pay them for a couple of months, mm. but then eventually we have to pay them. So I think the cash flow flow on effect of all that is going to be huge. And 
Um, my gut feel is in 12 or 18 months. That's when it's going to it's gonna, Yeah, it's going to be a lot worse than what it is through this next six months because we're not going to have the same support or understanding. Right now, I can ring my landlord and he's like, yeah, I understand. We'll work through this together. In 12 months' time, as you're going to tell me, mate, get fucked and pay your rent. Mm, mm. <laughs> Sorry for swearing. Oh, that's okay. I mean, I think think it's, um, you know, at this particular time, a, a swear word here and there <laughs> is absolutely okay. <laughs> so but with, with that in mind, I mean, you're obviously talking to a lot of clients at the moment. What's your advice for, you know, building financial resilience at this point yeah. in time? All right. So I'm, I'm going to run you through. There's probably seven, seven or eight different things I've been telling people to do mm. straight away. And it will ignore the government stuff for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless of whether you get anything or not. The first thing everyone should be doing, especially business owner clients or even personal, doing a cash flow forecast, like looking forward at your business and planning the next 12 months and seeing like how long you can survive with very little cash coming in the door. Because even if you've got work, I imagine the payment terms that people are going to pay you are going to extend dramatically. So factor in the fact you're not going to make much money, come through with sales and see how long you can live for. Whether that's in your household or whether that's in your business, do that exercise because I think we've lived as a society in a bit of abundance and mm. people haven't really put money aside for a rainy day. Totally. And I think it's about to storm. So mm, we're, Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're returning to an age of scarcity. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think as a generation we're prepared for that because we've never had to deal with that. Mm. Um, so yeah, so first step is do that. Do that exercise. Understand how long you could live without any money. I I think that's um, it, more than anything. It will make you kind of appreciate the situation we're in at the moment. Um, and from there, the next step is go through every single expense you have, both in your personal life and in your business, and just cut everything. Like mm, leave nothing that you can leave. Yeah, just strip all of it. So. Um, whether that's your Netflix account or whether that's your um, flowers on your front desk or you know any, anything that you can cut out of your business, now's the time to do it. Whether you know, maybe your mobile phone plan, like anything that can get removed, it needs to be removed because. And what would again, you, in terms of business cash flow, what would you determine as essential versus non-essential? Only things that I need to deliver my service to my customers. Right. Okay. Is the only okay. essential expense I have. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, it's you know, it can go. Like right now, my team, I'm in the office today, but I've got 17 people sitting at home working from home. I'm sitting here going, do I actually really need an office? Mm. If I could get rid of this rent for, like, I don't know how long this um, this kind of pandemic lasts for. If it's six months or it's all good, we come back and the world keeps turning. But if it's 12 months or 18 months, like I can half my office space and tell people that, we have half the team working from home, half the team working from the office from now on, and we'll rotate week to week. Mm, mm. Like start to get. So looking at what's really, feasible. Yeah, what's yep. feasible, and just cut everything. Like we can always, you can always go resubscribe to Spotify, mm. or order the flight. There's no reason why things aren't as bad as what we think they are, or what the world's telling us they are. That we can't just, you know, go and re-incur these expenses. But right now, like. My my honest view is that I think right now we've, we're we're overreacting to the situation because we don't know, but I'd rather overreact and be in a place of all right, cool, I can go back to that than underreact and go, I wish I cut that earlier. Yeah, well, and that's a part of being purposeful and proactive about the current situation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and and that's the other that's the other thing I'm kind of saying to people around that. It's, it's exactly that. It's don't sit on your hands and wait for the pain to come to start taking action. Take action today and then worry about reversing it later. So, Danny, I, I want to ask you a question that may seem a little naive, actually, but it's mm. one that came to mind for me. You know, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of crisis to deal with, whether it be the bushfires, the droughts, flooding, and, and now COVID nineteen. When the government is pulling together all of these relief packages, where is the money coming from? Like, do we need to print more money? How does it work? Basically, you're spot on. We're, we're borrowing money and printing money and or the government's borrowing money and printing money to push it into the economy. Um, similar, similar to what we happened with the GFC when the government done the $900 handouts. Uh, you would have seen the government this year spoke in that, spoke in that, that they're going to um, be back in the black for the first time ever. Mm. So it's taken us 11 years to recover or to pay that money back from all the money we handed out back in the GFC time. That's essentially what we're repeating now. The government's printing money, borrowing money, putting it in the economy. Then we're going to have to pay that back over a period of time through taxes or, uh, you know, I guess they're cutting spending from the government. If they don't have the, if, if you're paying taxes next year, 
they won't be able to spend as much of that money into the economy. They're going to have to pay it back to, you know, wherever pay they're getting this money from at the moment. Yeah, yeah okay. correct. So it's, it's it, we're essentially like think about the government borrowing the money from a bank to put into our economy. At some point, we're going to pay that back. The government gets its revenue from taxes. I mean, does the implication of that on a national level kind of even out because it's happening all over the world? Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing right now. Like the thing that's really difficult is trying to compare this to an event that's happened before or trying to work out what the flow on effect's going to be, but you're spot on. It, like the money's got to come from somewhere. Who's actually, wh- where's this money actually coming from? Yeah. Um, because you're right, it's happening in every single country in the world. So, Danny, let's have a look at, at the packages we have available. Now, firstly, I want to say that obviously all of this information is available online and, and probably on every news channel if you flicked on the TV at the moment. So as you run through these, Danny, I've, I have a request. I'm really interested to understand what your opinion is and what your ideas are with regard to the packages we have available. Um, so how's the government helping small business as a starting point? Uh, they're doing everything they can, I feel like. I don't think there's going to be an answer that's going to be like satisfy everyone. So my first yeah. point is uh, I, th- I feel like they're doing as much as they can to keep people employed. I think everything they're doing is to try and stop people from firing their staff. Unfortunately, the first approach people should be taking and are taking is to get rid of their staff because that's the biggest cost to their businesses and they're all scared of the unknown. Yeah. But in terms of actually what they're doing and, and how small business can access it, um, the first measure they put in place, which they extended, is this hundred thousand dollar. I guess um, they're calling it cash relief, but it's basically you won't pay tax on the tax you withhold on wages in your next two basses. You won't have to pay up to fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and whatever whatever benefit you get in those two basses, they'll give you. They'll repeat in the next quarter bass as well. So they're just trying to extend that payment term to give you a hundred thousand dollars, basically of wages on tax credit as a maximum. So um, assuming our wages are structured the right way, is there anything we need to do to make this nah, happen? No, nah. no. So, so provided everything's structured the right way, there's nothing you need to do. Or just You'll love your bass. You'll still pay your GST. You just won't have to pay the wages portion of that. Right, okay. Um, the problem with this measure, like it, it's obviously a good initiative in terms of they're giving people essentially tax-free wages. Um, so it's a good initiative in that way. The problem with it is it doesn't give you cash into your business. It just stops you from paying the ATO. The reason why I say that's a problem is I know there's a lot of businesses out there that don't pay the ATO on time anyway. Mm. So it's, it's not actually providing cash into the economy as such. It's just meaning that they're not getting in trouble for not paying the ATO. So um, it's, a, it's a great measure for the people that, that it does help who were paying their wages and everything else on time like they should be. They'll obviously have a little bit of a saving there. Yep. But it's not going to help people live who weren't paying wages anyway or weren't paying that tax as what well, tax anyway. It's just going to, you know, obviously not let them incur a bigger debt with the ATO. So what happens if you were taking, say, owner drawings? Is there a way to you work need, back and restructure it? Yeah, so only if you've registered. It looks like they're blocking registrations because we've tried to look at it for some people at the moment. Right. So okay. you have to have registered for pay-as-you-go already. You, we can still get some of them through. You just have to call up and plead your case. Um, but everyone should be having a chat with their accountant like today to make sure they're structured correctly for their March bass. The it, It's all going to be based on your March and June bass and anyone on owner drawings or taking dividends need to re- have that looked at and see if they can restructure how they can structure it um, and making sure like without being dodgy, making mm. sure they maximize their benefit in, out of this. So, like it's not to, because if someone's taking owner drawings, they should be taking wages. There's nothing wrong with you restructuring that. Yeah, okay. It just perfect. it just needs to be it needs to be done right. So so talk to your accountant, make sure you're you've got that structured. If you don't have an accountant, call us, we'll look at it. But someone has to do your March bass for you that understands what's going on. So Danny, what does the asset write off of 150,000 mean? How does that how does that even work? So it's kind of irrelevant for most small businesses. They're not going to actually see a benefit out of this any different. Um, I think some of the bigger businesses will, but most small businesses won't. So w- we already had a rule in place that you had an asset write-off for expenses under $30,000, which was if you go buy a computer for $5,000, in if these rules weren't in place, you'd have to claim a deduction for that over four years, which means um, you're essentially accelerating your tax deductions to come in one year rather than split them over four. The reason why I'm saying it's kind of irrelevant is most small businesses aren't spending 
over thirty thousand dollars on any one item anyway, anyway to yeah. worry about whether it's thirty or one hundred and fifty thousand. So for most of us, it's irrelevant. It only makes sense like people that were going to buy a car that was worth forty five thousand. Now it's more beneficial for them to buy it because they can claim that in one year, not over eight years or something. Um, the reason why I'm saying it's not a real thing that actually helps dramatically is it's a tax deduction. So it just means that you won't pay tax on the money in the future. Right. So really, you're only any, you're only going to see the benefit of these in if you do spend over thirty thousand dollars and under one hundred and fifty. You're only going to see the benefit of it May next year when your tax returns due. Mm, okay. So the cash flow timing of it's irrelevant for helping you through this period. The reason they brought that rule in was to try and increase spending. Um, I think at a bigger business level to try and get them to spend a bit more money a bit faster yep, to try and yep. get the economy, keep the economy moving. I don't think they, at the time when they brought the first measures in, the first round of measures, I don't think they um, had realised how big the impact's going to be yeah. of, of the virus and you know, that's why the second round of measures came through. Yeah, and look, I mean, there's there's quite a few points here and you've done a really informative uh, video which is available online and I know there's a really great link and resource available on the Kelly and Partners website. What's that link just to share with our, our listeners? Uh, if you just go kellypartners.com.au, um, on the website there, there we're, we're keeping a rolling list of all the initiatives that the government announced and, and then how to apply for them yep. for the different ones. So that should just be your go-to point from, all right, what can I get and how do I get it? Just go there because we'll keep it updated as more things come to light. Amazing. Um, and we're considering both federal, state and like banks and things like that. So anything that happens that there's relief for, we're, we're generally going to put there and that can be your go-to. We've also built some really good checklists of action items people could take. We touched on two of them before. Yep. But basically just it's a list of things you should be doing personally, a list of things you should be doing in your business immediately to try and navigate through this this yep. crisis basically. And, I mean, I know there's a, a push on small business lending with 150000 unsecured. Would you would you be encouraging people to do that? Yeah, so it's yep. actually 250000 unsecured loan. The, the government's yep. going to secure... 50% of it for the bank. So you only have to secure the other 50. We're not sure how the bank's going to, I guess, assess their part of this because um, I've had a few clients already get knocked back from the banks, which right. is which is mind-blowing um, given like, you know, you've got a gym that's been forced to shut down and the bank's not, the government's doing this initiative and the bank's like, yeah, no, we can't do anything because we don't know what your revenue is going to be. It's like, it's going to be zero. That's <laughs> Our revenue is zero. Mm. That's what the government's done. So there's going to um, be some gaps <laughs> process-wise here yeah, uncovered. Yeah, so yeah, correct. Yeah. So we've got to work through that. But if you can get access to it and you can get the loan, everyone, my my general advice is everyone should get it, whether you need it or not. Put the money aside. Don't go spending it. Don't go on a holiday. Don't go buy a car. Not that you can go on a holiday, but don't go spending <laughs> yeah, it. Keep, it. keep it there as a buffer um, just in case you need it. If we get to the other side of this and, and we're overreacting, like I said before, it's all well and good. Put the money back and life goes on. I'd rather my clients at least get access to the funds and be in a position to pay whatever they need to do to live. Like I, I'm looking at this as do you have enough money to live firstly and eat and you can look after your family, like get the money. If it means you have to feed your kids, you have to feed your kids. I don't care where you get your money from. Yeah. So, you know, in America they've got gun sales spiking. In Australia I'd rather people get a loan than buy guns to try and feed their kids. So Absolutely. That's <laughs> terrible. I like, and, and yeah, like wow. I said, I'm probably overreacting and I'd rather be overreacting than underreacting. Yeah. But get access to the money, any money you can save now from a, like whether it's the tax relief or um, you get the talk to your landlord and get them to stop your rent or anything like that, you should just be putting aside and just building a bit of a cash pile, hopefully, that you can use as we go through this period. Mm. So, Danny, I mean, you've spoken about some of the the situations that your clients are dealing with, and I, I imagine there would be a few who may have been subject to the mass close down of all non-essential services. Yes. Can, can you talk me through what the government is, is doing to help individuals at the moment who might be dealing with, um, you know, redundancy and job loss and, and the implications mm. of that? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So yeah. there's a lot. Like, I think there was a report this morning that they said we're already at a thirty percent unemployment rate in the country based on all the job losses that have happened this last, you know, seven days or so. Which I, I haven't. I don't. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's a huge number. Mm. Um, what they're doing. So they've doubled the the two major things, at least for the younger people. Um, there's some more for seniors, but the two major things that they're doing are they've doubled the. Uh, Centrelink benefits, so from five fifty to a max, from a maximum of five fifty to a maximum of eleven hundred dollars if you've got no work. Um, so I'd be telling everyone that 
has no work, even if it's from their own company, if they make themselves redundant, go to the go to Centrelink and get that eleven hundred dollars a fortnight. You should be trying to live off that, um, so you're not eating into your own savings and everything else. Mm. Um, that's probably the first point I'm telling everyone: just get used to a life where you live off eleven hundred dollars a fortnight, because yeah, that's basically the only money you're going to be able to bank on for the short term or for the next six months. Yeah. Um, secondly, is They've done. They've put an initiative forward where you'll be able to access your super, your superannuation early. Um, the government realizes that that super is there for when you need it in retirement, but you probably need it more now than you're ever going to need it in your life. So they're giving people access to that early, which is a huge measure. What you can access is ten thousand dollars before June thirty and ten thousand dollars after June thirty. You have to apply for it online to go through the process, but my my general view for uh, my my general advice around this to people is try not to touch it if you can avoid it. Yeah. And the reason being is we've just had a 40% or 30% drop in the share market. Everyone's supers has taken a massive hit. Um, I'd rather they leave it yeah, there. Yeah, if and we can avoid on. digging in yeah, there. Yeah, 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 correct. If we mm. can avoid digging in, then avoid digging in. Um, so, yeah. It's a hard one, but if you need it again, if you need it to eat and you're starving, go to it. If you can avoid it, just leave it and find other means. Use that center link money, etc. Yep. Um, yeah. So it's a hard one, but that's a, that's my view. Now, Danny, you were just talking about um, the fact you're encouraging people to to get on the new start allowance, and I think it's quite an interesting segue to my next question, where I want to dive into the the future a little bit here. So mm. as I mentioned to you before, it was just completely by chance this year, I themed uh, this podcast, The Turning Point. Now, I read an article the other day that was talking about the introduction of universal basic income and negative tax to subside people's wages. Do you think that COVID-19 will be a significant turning point with regards to the future of finance? Good question. I, I think it's going to be a turning point for not just finance. I think for a lot of industries and a lot of things, what's going to, so yes. So firstly, yes on finance, yes mm. on taxes. I think we are already heading to an interesting world where interest rates were going down. We were going to get to negative interest rates and that kind of stuff, which we've probably never experienced or never, you know, we'd obviously don't understand hundred percent what that means yet. Um, so I think this will just speed up a lot of that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, I think the way banks are going to have to assess loans in this period is going to change. And I think it's definitely going to be some some big changes on the back of that. But I think more broadly, like thinking about what I was saying before about my accounting firm, everyone's working from home. Um, I'm potentially going to restructure how I operate. You spoke to me about moving to more digital products. I think every single industry and every single business would be looking at this and going, all right, what am I going to change to make my business different? Yeah. Um, through a period like this, which is going to force a lot of innovation and a lot of, um, you know, different ways of thinking and approaching business. It'll also force a lot of businesses to shut down. Like my father-in-law owns a news agency and I was saying to him, because he's obviously stressing like everyone else, I was saying to him, like, he should be planning for the fact that no one's going to ever come back to the news agency to buy the lotto, which is the only thing that he kind of had left as a point of difference. Because if we shut down for six months, people will get used to buying it online if they continue to buy it yeah. and they'll never go back. Um, so, so just getting used to the fact that the world's going to change. All my clients are now we're doing video calls where before they thought they had to meet me in person and they're mm. like, no, we have to meet in person. Like, well, now we've got no choice. They're all learning that it works the same, which means I don't have to travel four hours a day. Yeah. So, I mean, even something as small as, as you know, using tap and go rather than cash. Yeah, correct. Like, mm. and, and, yeah, like I can't actually leave my house to pay something in cash, so it means I'm using bank transfers. Like it'll just speed up the removal of cash from the economy potentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's going to be a whole, depending how long this lasts, if we if we get a two-week shutdown and everyone goes back to work, then it obviously it'll be different. I'm just unsure what, yeah, I don't know what they, how long it will last and the longer it lasts, the more that will change. So Danny, we've, we've been buddies for quite a few years and <laughs> um, you're a parent of two beautiful children. Now yeah. your kids are maybe a little bit too young, as is my daughter, but I, I was wondering, have you got any tips uh, for talking to kids, not so much about COVID-19, but about what this means from a financial or economic perspective? Because I'm sure there's lots of young people who, who might be feeling the panic of their parents at this point in time. Yeah, I, to be honest, I hope they're oblivious to it because I don't think it's fair that, it, that, mm. that they realise, like they have to experience this or worry about this stuff. So 
I think when I was younger, I probably would have been too young and dumb to actually know or appreciate the ramifications of what's going on. And I hope most kids are the same. If there's anything that they need to kind of understand or learn, and I see this from a tax perspective or a finance perspective all the time, and it stresses me out. I stress more about other people's money than they do, I feel like. But um, if there's one thing people need to take from this, it's saving for a rainy day, like putting money aside, don't live out by on your means, don't go get credit card debt to buy things you can't afford, that kind of conversation. If it forces that and nothing else, it's not a bad thing. Mm. So I've come to my last question today. Um, as your friend, I have to say I've watched in awe as I've seen you rise over the last few weeks and, and really, you know, <laughs> Thanks, really, babe. really step into your purpose. I mean, I've always known that you're an extraordinary human and an entrepreneur and so amazing at what you do because you're a person who has such a huge, huge heart. I mean, even then you were just saying that you worry about people's money more than they do. And knowing you, I would 110% believe that to, <laughs> to be uh, true. So i I was interested, how do you feel about the expression of your purpose in the context of COVID-19? Do you, Are you feeling more connected to why you do what you do in the world right now? Yeah, I think, uh, like getting a bit personal, I think um, we all we all live for a sense of purpose and being and like in school it might be sport or, you know, it's probably sport that kind of gave me a purpose and people spoke to me about that. And I think always having something that people, having some relevance in the world and, um, helping people and having a reason to help people always makes you feel obviously better as a person. But um, I genuinely do love business and I do love talking to people about business and I do love helping people. So whether it's this or something else, I've always, um, you know, uh, I, I guess it's in my nature a bit, but I've, it's something I really enjoy. So it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like um, I'm doing anything special or different. It just feels like, I guess, yeah, one of a different world. It feels like I'm doing what I'm meant to do or my purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I absolutely it it, believe that you are because everything you've been doing is just so helpful. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I find it useful to other people. I, I, I get a lot of messages every day from people saying thank you and they're, they're appreciating it, which makes it feel better and makes you want to do it more, makes it easier. Um, but people, like on the other side of it, people really need it at the moment. And I don't think, I think people get overwhelmed with information and there's not enough clear information out there for or a source for them to go to to get an mm -hmm. answer. So if we can provide that stability now, then it's obviously not a bad thing. Danny Chia, it has been absolutely a pleasure to have you on Decoding Purpose, The Turning Point. Um, can you just repeat for me that Kelly and Partners link? Because I would recommend anyone out there who's needing financial advice to to jump on there and, and ask for Danny. He's your guy when it comes <laughs> to navigating finance in these uncertain times. So go to kellypartners.com.au. As I said, there's a there's a web page there which has a live list of the stuff that's going on um, and also resources for where you should go to to apply for different things. So it should just be your base point. Um, if you do need to talk to me, feel free to call me or message me. My mobile is 0406 181 My phone's getting hammered at the moment, so <laughs> bear with me if I take a little bit to get back. Maybe but, send a text um, message. <laughs> yeah, send me a text message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but, yeah head to the website. That's where your information is. And Beck, it's been a pleasure talking to you as well, mate. Absolutely love having you as a friend and having you as someone I can count on to. Oh, absolutely. As always. And, and as soon as we can catch up in person, we will. <laughs> in the meantime, <laughs> virtual coffees. Yeah, yeah, virtual coffees. We have to work out how that's going to work. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Danny. Cheer. Thank you. <laughs> 